Chapter 8 of Noted Speeches of Abraham Lincoln, edited by Lillian Marie Briggs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Williams. Noted Speeches of Abraham Lincoln, edited by Lillian Marie Briggs. Chapter 8. Stephen Arnold Douglas, Biographical Sketch Stephen Arnold Douglas was born at Brandon, Vermont, on the 23rd of April, 1813. When a child, he lived on a farm, working in the fields in the summer and attending the district school during the winter months. At the age of 15, young Douglas realized his condition in life, that his widowed mother was not in circumstances to give him an education, so he suppressed his ambition for college for the time and apprenticed himself to a cabinet maker in Middlebury. Here he worked with enthusiasm for two years. The following year he spent in Brandon, his native town, attending the academy. At the close of that year he moved with his mother to Canandaigua, New York, at once becoming a student at the fine academy located there. He remained in Canandaigua three years, applying himself diligently to his academic studies also finding time to follow a course in the study of law. In 1833, the young man of 23 years removed Winchester, Illinois, to earn for himself a livelihood. For a few months, he taught school and continued his law studies. The next year, he was admitted to the bar in Jacksonville, where he had stopped for a short time before reaching Winchester. Mr. Douglas was elected state's attorney of the 1st Judicial District in 1835. In 1836, he was elected to the Illinois Legislature. The following year, he was appointed Registrar of Public Lands at Springfield, to which place he removed. In 1841, he was appointed Secretary of State, but soon resigned to accept the office of Judge of the Supreme Court of the State. In 1843, Mr. Douglas was elected to Congress, where he served for two terms. He was re-elected to the House for the third term, but at the following session of the Legislature, December 1846, he was chosen for the United States Senate, of which he remained a member until his death. Senator Douglas died on the 3rd of June, 1861. Stephen A. Douglas Lincoln-Douglas Debate First Joint Debate Delivered at Ottawa, Illinois, August 21, 1858 Douglas's Opening Speech Ladies and Gentlemen, I appear before you today for the purpose of discussing the leading political topics which now agitate the public mind. By an arrangement between Mr. Lincoln and myself, we are present here today for the purpose of having a joint discussion as the representatives of the two great political parties of the state and union upon the principles and issue between those parties. And this vast concourse of people shows the deep feeling which pervades the public mind in regard to the questions dividing us. Prior to 1854, this country was divided into two great political parties, known as the Whig and Democratic parties. Both were national and patriotic, advocating principles that were universal in their application. An old line Whig could proclaim his principles in Louisiana and Massachusetts alike. Whig principles had no boundary sectional line. They were not limited by the Ohio River, nor by the Potomac, nor by the line of the free and slave states but applied and were proclaimed wherever the Constitution ruled or the American flag waved over the American soil. So it was, and so it is with the great Democratic Party, which from the days of Jefferson until this period has proven itself to be the historic party of the nation. While the Whig and Democratic parties differed in regard to a bank, the tariff, distribution, the specie circular, and the sub-treasury, they agreed on the great slavery question which now agitates the Union. I say that the Whig Party and the Democratic Party agreed on the slavery question, while they differed on those matters of expediency to which I have referred. The Whig Party and the Democratic Party jointly adopted the Compromise Measures of 1850 as the basis of a proper and just solution of the slavery question in all its forms. Clay was the great leader, with Webster on his right and Cass on his left, and sustained by the patriots in the Whig and Democratic ranks who had devised and enacted the Compromise Measures of 1850. During the session of Congress in 1853-54, I introduced into the Senate of the United States a bill to organize the territories of Kansas and Nebraska on that principle which had been adopted in the Compromise Measures of 1850, 
approved by the Whig Party and the Democratic Party in Illinois in 1851, and endorsed by the Whig Party and the Democratic Party in National Convention in 1852, in order that there might be no misunderstanding in relation to the principle involved in the Kansas and Nebraska Bill, I put forth the true intent and meaning of the act in these words, quote, It is the true intent and meaning of this act not to legislate slavery into any state or territory, or to exclude it therefrom, but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, subject only to the federal constitution. End quote. Thus, you can see that up to 1854, when the Kansas and Nebraska bill was brought into Congress for the purpose of carrying out the principles which both parties had up to that time endorsed and approved, there had been no division in this country with regard to that principle, except the opposition of the abolitionists. In 1854, Mr. Abraham Lincoln and Mr. Lyman Trumbull entered into an arrangement, one with the other, and each with his respective friends, to dissolve the old Whig party on the one hand, and to dissolve the old Democratic party on the other, and to connect the members of both into an abolition party under the name and disguise of a Republican party. The terms of that arrangement between Lincoln and Trumbull have been published by Lincoln's special friend, James H. Matheny, Esquire, and they were that Lincoln should have General Shields' place in the United States Senate, which was then about to become vacant, and that Trumbull should have my seat when my term expired. Lincoln went to work to abolitionize the old Whig party all over the state, pretending that he was then as good a Whig as ever, and Trumbull went to work in his part of the state preaching abolitionism in its milder and lighter form and trying to abolitionize the Democratic Party and bring old Democrats handcuffed and bound hand and foot into the abolition camp. In pursuance of the arrangement, the parties met in Springfield in October 1854 and there proclaimed their new platform. Lincoln was to bring into the abolition camp the old line Whigs and transfer them over to Giddings, Chase, Fred Douglas and Parson Lovejoy, who were ready to receive them and christen them in their new faith. They laid down on that occasion a platform for their new Republican Party, which was thus to be constructed. I have the resolutions of that state convention then held, which was the first mass state convention ever held in Illinois by the Black Republican Party, and I now hold them in my hands, and will read a part of them and cause the others to be printed. Here are the most important and material resolutions of this abolition platform. Resolved. That we believe this truth to be self-evident, that when parties become subversive of the ends for which they are established, or incapable of restoring the government to the true principles of the Constitution, it is the right and duty of the people to dissolve the political bands by which they may have been connected therewith, and to organize new parties upon such principles and with such views as the circumstances and exigencies of the nation may demand. Resolved. That the times imperatively demand the reorganization of parties, and repudiating all previous party attachments, names, and predilections, we unite ourselves together in defense of the liberty and constitution of the country, and will hereafter cooperate as the Republican Party, pledged to the accomplishment of the following purposes, to bring the administration of the government back to the control of first principles, to restore Nebraska and Kansas to the position of free territories, that, as the Constitution of the United States vests in the states, and not in Congress, the power to legislate for the extradition of fugitives from labor, to repeal and entirely abrogate the fugitive slave law, to restrict slavery to those states in which it exists, to prohibit the admission of any more slave states into the Union, to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, to exclude slavery from all the territories over which the general government has exclusive jurisdiction, and to resist the acquirement of any more territories unless the practice of slavery therein forever shall have been prohibited. Resolved that in furtherance of these principles we will use such constitutional and lawful means as shall seem best adapted to their accomplishment, and that we will support no man for office under the general or state government who is not positively and fully committed to the support of these principles, and whose personal character and conduct is not a guarantee that he is reliable, and who shall not have abjured old party allegiance and ties. Now, gentlemen, your black Republicans have cheered every one of those propositions, and yet I venture to say that you cannot get Mr. Lincoln to come out and say that he is now in favor of each one of them, that these propositions, one and all, constitute the platform of the black Republican Party of this day, I have no doubt, and when you were not aware for what purpose I was reading them, your black Republicans cheered them as good black Republican doctrines. 
My object in reading these resolutions was to put the question to Abraham Lincoln this day whether he now stands and will stand by each article in that creed and carry it out. 1. I desire to know whether Mr. Lincoln stands today as he did in 1854 in favor of the unconditional repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law. 2. I desire him to answer whether he stands pledged today as he did in 1854 against the admission of any more slave states into the Union, even if the people want them. 3. I want to know whether he stands pledged against the admission of a new state into the Union with such a constitution as the people of that state may see fit to make. 4. I want to know whether he stands today pledged to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. 5. I desire him to answer whether he stands pledged to the prohibition of the slave trade between the different states. 6. I desire to know whether he stands pledged to prohibit slavery in all the territories of the United States, north as well as south of the Missouri Compromise Line. 7. I desire him to answer whether he is opposed to the acquisition of any more territory unless slavery is prohibited therein. I want his answer to these questions. Your affirmative cheers in favor of this abolition platform are not satisfactory. I ask Abraham Lincoln to answer these questions in order that, when I trot him down to Lower Egypt, southernmost Illinois, I may put the same questions to him. My principles are the same everywhere. I can proclaim them alike in the north, the south, the east, and the west. My principles will apply wherever the Constitution prevails and the American flag waves. I desire to know whether Mr. Lincoln's principles will bear transplanting from Ottawa to Jonesboro. I put these questions to him today distinctly and ask an answer. I have a right to an answer, for I quote from the platform of the Republican Party, made by himself and others at the time that party was formed, and the bargain made by Lincoln to dissolve and kill the old Whig Party and transfer its members bound hand and foot to the Abolition Party under the direction of Giddings and Fred Douglas. In the remarks I have made on this platform, and the position of Mr. Lincoln upon it, I mean nothing personally disrespectful or unkind to that gentleman. I have known him for nearly twenty-five years. There were many points of sympathy between us when we first got acquainted. We were both comparatively boys, and both struggling with poverty in a strange land. I was a schoolteacher in the town of Winchester, and he a flourishing grocery keeper in the town of Salem. He was more successful in his occupation than I was in mine, and hence more fortunate in this world's goods. Lincoln is one of those peculiar men who perform with admirable skills everything which they undertake. I made as good a schoolteacher as I could, and when a cabinet-maker, I made a good bedstead and tables, although my old boss said I succeeded better with bureaus and secretaries than with anything else. But I believe that Mr. Lincoln was always more successful in business than I, for his business enabled him to get into the legislature. I met him there, however, and had sympathy with him because of the uphill struggle we both had in life. He was then just as good at telling an anecdote as now. He could beat any of the boys wrestling or running a foot race, in pitching quoits or tossing a copper, could ruin more liquor than all the boys together, and the dignity and impartiality with which he presided at a horse race or fist fight excited the admiration and won the praise of everybody that was present and participated. I sympathized with him because he was struggling with difficulties, and so was I. Mr. Lincoln served with me in the legislature in 1836, when we both retired, and he subsided or became submerged, and he was lost sight of as a public man for some years. In 1846, when Wilmot introduced a celebrated proviso, and the abolition tornado swept over the country, Lincoln again turned up as a member of Congress from the Sagamon District. I was then in the Senate of the United States, and was glad to welcome my old friend and companion. Whilst in Congress, he distinguished himself by his opposition to the Mexican War, taking the side of the common enemy against his own country, and when he returned home, he found that the indignation of the people followed him everywhere, and he was again submerged, or obliged to retire into private life, forgotten by his former friends. He came up again in 1854, just in time to make this abolition or black Republican platform, in company with Giddings, Lovejoy, Chase, and Fred Douglas, for the Republican Party to stand upon. Having formed this new party for the benefit of deserters from Whiggery and deserters from democracy, and having laid down the abolition platform which I have read, Lincoln now takes his stand and proclaims his abolition doctrines. Let me read a part of them. In his speech at Springfield to the convention which nominated him for the Senate, he said, quote, In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. 
I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Good, good, and cheers. I am delighted to hear you black Republicans say good. I have no doubt that doctrine expresses your sentiments, and I will prove to you now, if you will listen to me, that it is revolutionary and destructive of the existence of this government. Mr. Lincoln, in the extract from which I have just read, says that this government cannot endure permanently in the same condition in which it was made by its framers, divided into free and slave states. He says that it has existed for about seventy years thus divided, and yet he tells you that it cannot endure permanently on the same principles and in the same relative condition in which our fathers made it. Why can it not exist divided into free and slave states? Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, Hamilton, Jay, and the great men of that day made this government divided into free and slave states, and left each state perfectly free to do as it pleased on the subject of slavery. Why can it not exist on the same principles on which our forefathers made it? They knew when they framed the Constitution that in a country as wide and as broad as this, with such a variety of climate, production, and interest, the people necessarily required different laws and institutions in different localities. They knew that the laws and regulations which would suit the granite hills of New Hampshire would be unsuited to the rice plantations of South Carolina, and they therefore provided that each state should retain its own legislature and its own sovereignty, with the full and complete power to do as it pleased within its own limits in all that was local and not national. One of the reserved rights of the states was the right to regulate the relations between master and servant on the slavery question. At the time the Constitution was framed, there were 13 states in the Union, 12 of which were slaveholding states, and one a free state. Suppose this doctrine of uniformity preached by Mr. Lincoln, that the states should all be free or all be slave, had prevailed, and what would have been the result? Of course, the 12 slaveholding states would have overruled the one free state, and slavery would have been fastened by a constitutional provision on every inch of the American Republic, instead of being left as our fathers wisely left it, to each state to decide for itself. Here I assert that uniformity in the local laws and institutions of the different states is neither possible nor desirable. If uniformity had been adopted when the government was established, it must inevitably have been the uniformity of slavery everywhere, or else the uniformity of Negro citizenship and Negro equality everywhere. We are told by Lincoln that he is utterly opposed to the Dred Scott decision and will not submit to it, for the reason that he says it deprives the Negro of the rights and privileges of citizenship. That is the first and main reason which he assigns for his warfare on the Supreme Court of the United States and its decision. I ask you, are you in favor of conferring upon the Negro the rights and privileges of citizenship? Do you desire to strike out of our state constitution that clause which keeps slaves and free Negroes out of the state and allow the free Negroes to flow in and cover your prairies with black settlements? Do you desire to turn this beautiful state into a free Negro colony in order that when Missouri abolishes slavery she can send 100,000 emancipated slaves into Illinois to become citizens and voters on an equality with yourselves? If you desire Negro citizenship, if you desire to allow them to come into the state and settle with the white man, if you desire them to vote on an equality with yourselves and to make them eligible for your races. Mr. Lincoln, following the example and lead of all the little abolition orators who go around and lecture in the basements of schools and churches, reads from the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal, and then asks, how can you deprive a Negro of that equality which God and the Declaration of Independence award to him? He and they maintain that Negro equality is guaranteed by the laws of God and that it is asserted in the Declaration of Independence. If they think so, of course they have a right to say so, and so vote. I do not question Mr. Lincoln's conscientious belief that the Negro was made his equal, and hence is his brother. But for my own part, I do not regard the Negro as my equal, and positively deny that he is my brother or any kin to me whatever. I do not believe that the Almighty ever intended the Negro to be the equal of the white man. If he did, he has been a long time demonstrating the fact. 
For thousands of years the Negro has been a race upon the earth, and during that time, in all latitudes and climates, wherever he has wandered or been taken, he has been inferior to the race which he has met there. He belongs to an inferior race and must always occupy an inferior position. I do not hold that because the Negro is our inferior, therefore he ought to be a slave. By no means can such a conclusion be drawn from what I have said. On the contrary, I hold that humanity and Christianity both require that the Negro shall have and enjoy every right, every privilege, and every immunity consistent with the safety of the society in which he lives. On that point, I presume there can be no diversity of opinion. You and I are bound to extend to our inferior and dependent beings every right, every privilege, every facility, and immunity consistent with the public good. The question then arises, what rights and privileges are consistent with the public good? This is a question which each state and each territory must decide for itself. Illinois has decided it for herself. We have provided that the Negro shall not be a slave, and we have also provided that he shall not be a citizen, but protect him in his civil rights, in his life, his person, and his property, only depriving him of all political rights whatsoever, and refusing to put him on an equality with the white man. That policy of Illinois is satisfactory to the Democratic Party and to me, and if it were to the Republicans, there would then be no question upon the subject. But the Republicans say he ought to be made a citizen, and when he becomes a citizen, he becomes your equal, with all your rights and privileges. They assert the Dred Scott decision to be monstrous because it denies that the Negro is or can be a citizen under the Constitution. Now, I hold that Illinois has a right to abolish and prohibit slavery as she did, and I hold that Kentucky has the same right to continue and protect slavery that Illinois had to abolish it. I hold that New York has as much right to abolish slavery as Virginia has to continue it, and that each and every state of this Union is a sovereign power with the right to do as it pleases upon this question of slavery and upon all its domestic institutions. Slavery is not the only question which comes up in this controversy. There is a far more important one to you, and that is, what shall be done with the free Negro? In relation to the policy to be pursued toward the free Negroes, we have said that they shall not vote, whilst Maine, on the other hand, has said that they shall vote. Maine is a sovereign state and has the power to regulate the qualifications of its voters within her limits. I would never consent to confer the right of voting and of citizenship upon a Negro, but still I am not going to quarrel with Maine for differing from me in opinion. Let Maine take care of her own Negroes and fix the qualifications of her own voters to suit herself without interfering with Illinois, and Illinois will not interfere with Maine. So with the state of New York. She allows the Negro to vote provided he owns $250 worth of property, but not otherwise. While I would not make any distinction whatever between a Negro who held property and one who did not, yet if the sovereign state of New York chooses to make that distinction, it is her business and not mine and I will not quarrel with her for it. She can do as she pleases on this question if she minds her own business, and we will do the same thing. Now, my friends, if we will only act conscientiously and rigidly upon this great principle of popular sovereignty, which guarantees to each state and territory the right to do as it pleases on all things local and domestic, instead of Congress interfering, we will continue at peace with one another. Why should Illinois be at war with Missouri, or Kentucky with Ohio? or Virginia with New York, merely because their institutions differ. Our fathers intended that our institutions should differ. They knew that the North and the South, having different climates, productions, and interests, required different institutions. This doctrine of Mr. Lincoln, of uniformity among the institutions of the different states, is a new doctrine never dreamed of by Washington, Madison, or the framers of this government. Mr. Lincoln and the Republican Party set themselves up as wiser than these men who made this government, which has flourished for seventy years under the principle of popular sovereignty, recognizing the right of each state to do as it pleased. Under that principle we have grown from a nation of three or four millions to a nation of about thirty millions of people. We have crossed the Allegheny Mountains and filled up the whole Northwest, turning the prairie into a garden and building up churches and schools thus spreading civilization and Christianity where before there was nothing but savage barbarism. Under that principle we have become, from a feeble nation, the most powerful on the face of the earth, and if only we adhere to that principle, we can go forward, increasing in territory, in power, in strength, and in glory, 
until the Republic of America shall be the North Star that shall guide the friends of freedom throughout the civilized world. And why can we not adhere to the great principle of self-government upon which our institutions were originally based? I believe that this new doctrine preached by Mr. Lincoln and his party will dissolve the Union if it succeeds. They are trying to array all the northern states in one body against the South to excite a sectional war between the free states and the slave states in order that the one or the other may be driven to the wall. End of chapter 8. Recording by Matt Williams.